Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie zu dieser Sonderveranstaltung. Mein Name ist Dorothea Wendeburg, ich bin hier die Professorin für neuere Kirchengeschichte und Sie haben meinen Namen unter der Einladung gesehen. Deswegen führe ich jetzt auch ein bisschen ein in die Referentin von heute Abend. Für die meisten von Ihnen ist das ganz überflüssig, denn Frau Kollegin Perley lehrt ja in diesem Hause seit vielen Jahren. Sie ist Gastprofessorin unserer Fakultät. Im Hauptberuf ist sie allerdings Professorin an der New York University und zwar am Institut für multikulturelle Studien. Und das zeigt auch gleich, in welche Richtung ihre Forschung und ihre Interessen gehen. Sie interessiert sich besonders für die Überschneidungen zwischen Kultur, Religion, Geschichte und Wirtschaft. Und dieses in Vergangenheit und Gegenwart, das werden wir dann gleich auch merken. Wie renommiert sie ist im Blick auf das, was sie tut, zeigt sich daran, dass sie zum Beispiel die Mercator-Gastprofessur der DFG inne gehabt hat, dass sie hier am Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin zweimal gewesen ist und ähnliches mehr. Ich nenne von ihren vielen Büchern nur zwei. Das jüngste, noch nicht ins Deutsche übersetzte, heißt Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics and Theologies. Sie sehen diese drei äh, Dinge, die da zusammenkommen, of Relationality, also von Bezüglichkeit. Und zuvor hat sie ein Buch geschrieben, das Sie auch auf Deutsch lesen können, die neuen Evangelikalen, Freiheitsgewinne durch fromme Politik. Ein Titel, der für unsere deutschen Ohren sehr merkwürdig klingt, aber für Amerika sehr gut passt. Äh, neben den wissenschaftlichen Dingen und akademischen Dingen, die Frau Perli betreibt, ist sie auch eine gefragte Kolumnistin für Zeitungen aller Art. Sie hat praktisch in allen wichtigen äh, Zeitungen diesseits und jenseits des Atlantiks geschrieben, egal ob New York Times oder in den Guardian oder in der Zeit, in der Süddeutschen, in der Frankfurter Rundschau und alles an und mehrere weitere könnte ich noch anfügen. Das lasse ich aber jetzt, damit uns die Zeit nicht wegläuft und Sie selber zu uns sprechen können. First, let me thank Professor Vandenberg um, for um, organizing all of this rather at the spur of the moment, uh, at the very last minute, uh, and she pulled it all together brilliantly. And I'd also like to thank um, assistants um, Julia Dietrich and Moritz Wiedeenders, who have brought all kinds of assistance, including technical assistance, um, to this evening. Um, so if the PowerPoint mucks up, it's my fault, not theirs. Um, so it's my understanding uh, that my job here today is to explain the 2016 US presidential election or what the hell's going on over there, meaning that something is going on that is not understandable. I must say that I am moved and flattered that you think something understandable should be going on over there, a presumption uh, of rationality somewhat at odds with the American historical record. Actually, it's at odds with all historical records because people are not motivated primarily by reason. So my first point is, what's going on in the US is the same not understandable thing that always goes on. The Trump election was not exceptional, and therein lies the point. From socio-political moves that are ordinary may come substantial change. It worked. The election was, in fact, not only ordinary, but as American as apple pie, indeed a matter of our civil religion. Sociologist Robert Bella identified several biblical archetypes in America's civil creed, the Exodus chosen people, promised land, new Jerusalem, and sacrificial death and rebirth. In my remarks, I will talk about this civil faith about its fervor or enthusiasm, its commitment to the new and rejection of the old, and its application to Trump and to what we can expect from his policies and appointments. First, fervor. Problems, because they are with us, tend to be concrete and measurable. But solutions, as they project into the future, are a matter of belief. 
Americans, heir to people so devout they crossed an ocean to stay true to their principles, have faith in what will save the day. This is not Brussels bureaucracy or muddling through with Merkel. In America, it's the economy stupid when we're describing problems, but when it comes to solutions, beliefs count. The problems facing Trump voters are that they are being squeezed out of the globalized, technology-driven, high-skill economy and the culture accompanying it. But before we tell a doomsday story, we should note that the U.S. economy has steadily improved since 2009. Jobs have increased for 75 months in a row, the longest sustained record of growth since 1939. Mostly in full-time employment, and with those who are working part-time when they don't want to be working part-time, that percentage has fallen 2%. Unemployment is down to 4.7%. Hourly wages have risen, especially for low-income earners. 3.5 million people rose above the poverty line last year. That's the biggest drop in poverty since 1999. In September, the number of people working increased by 440,000, meaning, why is this important? Meaning those who have left the labor market in the recession are returning to jobs. The annual median household income rose to 56,500, up 5.2%, the largest rise since 1967. On the other hand, this improvement is not distributed equally, and the long-term trends are disturbing. Many Americans feel sidelined or fear that they or their children soon will be sidelined as the jobs that they're familiar with fade away. Fear of loss is a powerful motivator. Loss of material or emotional well-being, loss of a sense that one understands how the world works, and loss of the sense that one has some control over one's life. The Wall Street Journal analyzed the Trump vote this way. Trump rides a blue-collar wave. 55% of his supporters are white working class. Yet Trump voters included those in the middle classes, who too are experiencing an economic squeeze as middle-class purchasing power has stayed flat since the 1980s under Ronald Reagan, while costs of education, health care, and much else have risen. Middle-class families with both parents working feel that they cannot save for their kids' college educations, pay the health care bills, and save for their own retirement all at the same time. Average pre-tax earnings of the bottom 50% of Americans rose 2.6% over the last 40 years, 2.6. The pre-tax earnings of the top 10%, the top 10% rose by 231% over the same time. Upper middle class income has also not grown in the last 15 years. Today, the US has less upward mobility than Canada and Europe and is the most unequal of all Western uh, nations. Our Gini, or inequality, index is 85.1 in line with Russia, India, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan. The top 20% of households own over 84% of the wealth. The bottom 40% own 0.3%. CEO to worker pay ratio is 354 to 1. 50 years ago, it was 20 to 1. Yet the difference in the tax rates between the top 1% and the bottom 50% has narrowed from a 30-point difference to a 12-point difference as the tax rates for the upper income earners have been lowered for a more regressive tax rate. While children born in 1940 had a 92% chance of earning more than their parents, children born in 1980 have a 50% chance of doing so. In sum, both working and middle class are motivated by the present economic squeeze and by the fear of continuing decline, loss of control, and sense of powerlessness facing a government seemingly unresponsive to these concerns, government, by the way, um, over the last 40 years in both parties. 
But these economic features were key to the campaigns of all the candidates. What captures votes in the United States is not ec our economic sins, but beliefs about the path to salvation, about how to fix them. In America, salvation involves what Robert Bella called sacrificial death and rebirth, not only starting anew, but rejecting the old. This, after fervor, is the second article of our religious faith. Cast out the corrupt. We hear echoes of this in the preacher's rid ye of the devil, and traces in the parallel political call to throw the bastards out. It was loud in the Trump campaign, but emerges in alternate form in democratic positions as well. Populist demands grow loud when the bastards are identified as Washington insiders, constrainer of personal liberty, corrupt and incompetent. Nativist demands increase when the bastards are immigrants or other suspect groups. Every society has a coterie of groups that are traditionally suspect. We in the United States do too. In both populist and nativist versions, a troubled world will be set right when evil for forces are purged from the body politic. To the populist form first. When Obama was elected, opponents branded him a fascist and a communist. Now, it's not easy to be both at once, but Americans fear the same thing in both, government control. Whoever persuades the nation that he will keep the government small and individual opportunity large wins hearts and minds. Americans across the continent, class, religion, and race respect individualist, hardworking, risk-taking self-responsibility. They respect local voluntary associations, as Tocqueville called them, that get things done without help from outsiders, and they disdain freeloaders who rely on controlling government meddlers. Good things have come from this anti-authoritarianism. A, crit a, a critique of inherited privilege and of status quo ways of thinking, a willingness to develop new ways of life, and a robust sense of self-responsibility. But it has also brought an unreflective hostility to government programs and to people, immigrants, African Americans, whom some Americans fear do not share their values of responsible self-reliance. We can think of it this way. Government in America, wait a minute, am I on the right? Yes. We can think of it this way. Government in America is what religion is in Germany and other countries in Western Europe. Suspect, unterverdacht. Europeans constrain religion so that it may not impose its benighted, tyrannical power on the state, assumed to be secular, rational, and democratic. Americans, by contrast, constrain the state so that it may not impose its tyrannical will on democratic society, we the people. When facing problems, Germans say the government should throw the bastards out. Well, Americans say throw out the bastards in government. Americans have come by this honestly, or at least historically. We were born in a revolution against central government, but long before the settlers, starting in the 1620s, were fleeing the centralization power play between Parliament and Charles I, hoping to keep local traditions and local political control, they were very wary of London. Second, the many settlers who were religious dissenters were doubly suspicious of central government, first for its centralization and second for its religious persecution. All told, Americans were a group self-selected for keeping central government out of the new Jerusalem, a key trope of our civil religion. Third, the rough nature of settlement and frontier living until the early 20th century further encouraged individual and local self-reliance and the view that government was not good for much since there was relatively little government around to rely on. The role of government grew to be sure as the country did, 
but individual initiative and local community were long the keys to survival in the future. Their value, along with suspicion of central government, was imprinted in the American civil creed. Protestantism, too, had a role. It was also born in a revolution against Rome, and in America further prodded resistance to central authority. The mandate to read the Bible for oneself and to find one's own path to God in America encouraged fervent self-responsibility and unease with authorities, both political and ecclesial. The first great religious awakening in the 1730s and 40s, and the second from the 1820 to nearly the Civil War, were festivals of individual iconoclasm with breakaway religious groups and populist religious <clears throat> uh, ideas promoted by untrained, unschooled, but impassioned entrepreneurial preachers. The churches were not part of an elite system, but grassroots of the people. By the 19th century, two Kentucky preachers could in good anti-authoritarian conscience opine, quote, we are not personally acquainted with the writings of John Calvin, neither do we care, close quote. Reformed Protestantism, with its formative influence on American political development, held that the sovereign nation does not start with central government, but with local covenanted communities, the Ferdas, which form networks to constitute the nation. This gave the US its federal system of government, Ferdas Federal, and robust civil society, and its continuing suspicion of central government. From this history came the myth, the reality, and the value of local self-responsibility and individual self-reliance. The other side of the coin, suspicion of government. In America's civil religion, reliance on government authorities is for the faint and faithless of heart. Self-reliance is the Lord's Prayer, the Fata Unsa. Blessings come to those who rid themselves of the devil. In political discourse, to those who throw the bastards out, and most of all, the bastards in government. When Ronald Reagan, in 1981, said, quote, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem, close quote, he was channeling American history and zeal. So was Obama. In 2008, he too campaigned on change throwing the Bush, the Bush bastards out. As part of America's civil religion, belief in throwing the bums in government out transcends political party. Obama's message of change was absolutely traditional. But rid ye of the devil, throw the bastards out, means that America doesn't know what to do with its own government, which it always would like to throw out. This is writ large in the present election, but it is always writ somewhere in the American political landscape. Let's start with health care. After Obamacare was passed in 2010, two Supreme Court cases were brought holding that Obamacare is unconstitutional because it takes away our freedom. How? By requiring Americans to buy health insurance. Low-income earners receive government subsidy for the purchase. That is, government, the government requirement to buy health insurance is a violation of personal liberty. A second is example of suspicion of government is the passionate gun rights movement. The issue is not hunting or self-protection, as no gun legislation seeks to prohibit these. The purpose is rather, and I quote, to protect against the tyranny of our own government, close quote, as a lawyer for the National Rifle Association noted in a 2009 Harvard Law Journal article. Also in 2009, the executive vice president of the National Rifle Association, Wayne LaPierre, said, quote, our founding fathers understood that the guys with the guns make the rules, close quote. With Obama's election, in 2008, gun sales rose from between six to 700,000 a year, a low figure for the United States, to 1.1 million guns per year. Similarly, gun sales rose in 2016, as many feel feared 
that Hillary Clinton, if elected, would curtail gun purchases. Okay. Having briefly sketched the throw the bastards out form of our civil religion, I'd like to apply it to Trump's election. I will look at jobs, immigration, trade agreements, and Trump's bad boy behavior. Americans across the political spectrum who are angry today have legitimate complaints of economic squeeze, as we've discussed. The fear that it will worsen and the sense that they are powerless to stop it. Some, often older and white, see the complexion of the country growing browner. They fear that with this demographic shift, the value of hardworking self-reliance is fading. The values, after all, that gave ordinary people like themselves a chance. I'd like to stress this. It is not the desire to be pampered, but the values of hard work and self-reliance that they fear are being replaced by government handouts, handouts, freebies, to those who aren't working, and by a political and economic system that is no longer responsive to their own hard work. Sociologist Arlie Hochschild describes this understanding of what's going on as someone who is, feels that they are working hard for the American dream and yet seeing it fade away as others are jumping ahead in the line. Some of them are immigrants, some of them are black, and some of them are refugees who get aid from the government. And who's in the government? Blacks. Then the, little, then the liberal media mocks you for being racist, and these people feel betrayed. The paradox is that Amer immigrants to America have precisely the values of hardworking self-reliance, which is how they succeed in the American economy. In September, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine issued a report by researchers inclined for and against immigration. They found, one, immigration has, quote, little to no negative effects on overall wages and employment of native-born workers. Close quote. Two, high-skill immigrant, quote, have a significant positive impact on Americans with skills and on the working class as immigrants spur innovation, helping to create jobs. Three, American teenagers without high school degrees saw their hours of work reduced in competition with new immigrants, but not their ability to find jobs. Four, after the first generation, when immigrants cost the government more than they pay in taxes, about 57 billion annually, mostly for education of the children. In the second generation, immigrants add about $30 billion a year to the tax pool. In the third generation, immigrants add about $223 billion a year to the tax pool. In sum, the report found immigrants to be, and I quote, integral to the nation's economic growth, close quote. In sum, America's economic difficulties stem not from immigration, as the nativist version of throw the bastards out says, but from technological change, improved productivity, corporate tax shelters, and competition from developing countries in the world market. Yet even this is complex because Technological change accounts for far more job loss in the United States than even global com competition. Let's look at the steel industry, which lost 400,000 jobs between 1962 and 2005. But steel production has not declined in the United States. Job loss resulted from increased productivity of the mini mill, where you can produce the same amount of steel um, with far fewer human workers and greater reliance on machines. Overall, only 13% of manufacturing job losses result from globalization, the rest from technology change. While the US lost one million jobs to China between 2000 and 2007, the job loss stopped. There's no economic evidence that NAFTA yielded job loss. Um, as the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service concluded. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a largely conservative business group, reports that the reestablishment of trade tariffs as Trump campaigned on 
quote, in the best case scenario, would strip us of at least 3.5 million jobs, close quote. The prestigious Peterson Institute estimates that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so vilified by Trump during the campaign, would raise American wages and raise incomes by about $131 billion. It also found that existing trade agreements have added between 7,100 and 12,900 additional income to the average American household. Yet in Washington, uh, excuse me, in America, breaking up large international agreements designed by who? Washington. Feels like throwing the bastards in government out. Job loss might be addressed in the United States by improved education, worker retraining, and regional redevelopment by local and national government in coordination with businesses, especially businesses that close factories. Doing this, Pittsburgh, for example, compensated for its loss of 5,100 iron and steel jobs over 25 years by redevelopment in new industries, leading to a gain of 66,000 new jobs in healthcare, banking, and, and professional services. Pittsburgh is now booming. Interestingly, democratic states tend to have substantially more of this sort of investment and more progressive taxation than republican states do. And democratic states tend to score higher on income, life expectancy, and education levels. If you don't like these proposals, others might be better. But economic solutions that address America's economic problems often go unseen in the United States because the solutions people favor are a matter of belief. Trump gained the most over George W. Bush in areas that lost manufacturing jobs to foreign competition and where people blamed global trade, even though retraining and redevelopment addressed job loss in Democratic voting states. But retraining and redevelopment would mean increased government action to coordinate cooperation among federal government, local governments, industries, and education. And that kind of increased government action is at odds with the civil creed of many who would have to demand such redevelopment programs. Compare the situation today to the Tea Parties, which organized very quickly after Obama's election on a small government, throw the bastards out, platform because they were tapping into what Americans already believe. The problem is always the government. In Trump's populist base today, there is little, little popular will for the programs I've just described. And consequently, there is little political will. Hochschilds calls this the great paradox. Distrust of the federal government by those who need its help. In late 2016, November, December, 6.4 million people signed up for health insurance through Obamacare, far more than in the same period in 2015. The states with the most new enrollees were Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, all of which voted for Trump. In April 2009, in the depths of the economic crisis caused by private investment hijinks on Wall Street, 55% of Americans nonetheless thought the problem was big government, not big business. So when politicians like Trump say that the problem is big government, it sounds right. It taps into America's oldest belief system. It clicks. This goes some way towards explaining Trump's bad boy behavior. His politically incorrect speech adds to his appeal because it's a slap in the face of the educated elites whom Trump voters feel run the economy against them and who condescend to them. 
His bad boy behavior are a steam valve for anger at government anti-discrimination law that lets those perceived line jumpers, remember in Hochschild's um, imagining of the, in her research actually, um, on what Trump voters were thinking, those people jumping ahead a line of you even though you work hard and do all the right things, those line cutters. It's a slap in the face of the anti-discrimination laws that protect them. In April 2016, the Public Religion Research Institute reported, quote, two thirds of Trump supporters think the nation needs a leader who breaks the rules. Throw the bastards out and their prissy anti-discrimination laws too. One definition of tragedy is voting for policies that worsen your problems. The wealthy who voted for Trump made a self-interested but coherent choice for someone who will lower their taxes and promote business-friendly policies. But Trump's populist base may have made a tragic choice. His appointments and policies to date suggests he will not likely address their concerns. The Conservative Tax Foundation estimates that his um, economic plans will raise the debt from 2.6 trillion to 3.9 trillion in 10 years, even with the growth that he promises will come from his economic policies. Moody's estimates a loss of 3.5 million jobs from um, Trump's trade and tax policies. Whatever his economic plans really are, Trump's big task at the moment is to retain the support of the business wealthy and his populist base. As the expression goes, to dance at two weddings. This is the Republican coalition of the last 50 years. Should he lose one or the other block, the party risks splitting and losing its political hold. We see Trump's effort to keep each block satisfied in, Trump, in Trump's discussion of Obamacare and in his political appointments. First, Obamacare. To satisfy populist distrust of government programs and the health industries, that is both sides of the Republican coalition, Trump promises to repeal Obamacare as a first priority and moves to do so have already begun in Congress. But this has the problem of losing 30 million people their health insurance and canceling po popular health insurance regulations. 56% of those losing health insurance would be whites. 80% would be those without a college degree. In short, Trump's populist base. So Trump is also saying that he will repeal Obamacare but delay implementation hoping to reap the benefits of repealing and keeping Obamacare at the same time. How does Trump's uh, need to satisfy both the business bloc and the populist bloc show up in his appointments? Um, you should have a handout, a chart with his appointments. And you can, um, there are um, two or three of the most recent ones, I apologize, are not on there because he made them after I printed the chart. Um, and I'm going to summarize, and you can read it um, on your own later. Satisfying the big business block, the positions responsible for the American economy are filled not by those sympathetic to the working and middle classes, but by representatives of Wall Street notably Goldman Sachs, the very company Trump used to smear Clinton as an insider beholden to big money. His cabinet also includes representatives of the fossil fuel industries and of other large corporations that favor deregulation of domestic business. The weapons, nuclear, and associated industries will also benefit uh, from Trump's pledges to build up the military and U.S. nuclear capacity. Almost all of his appointees favor global free trade after all of that campaigning about closing the borders. Save three, Robert Lighthouser, Wilbur Ross, and Peter Navarro. This may mean 
open trade for big business, especially for the fossil fuel, nuclear, and military industries um, in the main, with some small increase in protectionist measures um, for other industries, giving big business open trade and his populist base some small increases in protectionist measures. Effects on the actual economy are yet unclear. But the shrewd observer will look at the financial benefits to these sectors, those represented in his cabinet and associated sectors, also as a guide to foreign policy. As we can see from Trump's warm relationship with Vladimir Putin, with whom he and several of his cabinet appointees share oil and drilling interests. So if you want to know, I've been asked what the foreign policy is going to be like, follow the money. Overall, domestically, Trump appointees, one, oppose increases in the minimum wage, that's the Mindestlohn, <coughs> parental leave, and overtime pay. They oppose campaign uh, finance. What have I got? No, let's see. Uh, they oppose campaign finance and election rule reform that would limit effects of money on politics and ensure that minorities are not barred from voting. Three, they support privatization of health care, education, affordable housing, and possibly social security. Uh, additionally helpful to fossil fuel and agribusiness, the Republicans in Congress um, their priorities include eliminating requirements to reduce methane gas emissions, eliminating the need to disclose payments to foreign countries for <coughs> extraction of national re natural resources, and eliminating restrictions on pesticide use. Trump also rejected Republican Governor Chris Christie's ethics code that would have barred lobbyists from working on the transition team in any area in which they had been a lobbyist in the last year. As the new Republican-controlled Congress began its session last week, House Republicans, you may have read, um, slashed the powers of the independent Office of Congressional Ethics, created in 2008 in response to corruption scandals in Congress. This independent office would be replaced by another one that would have fewer investigative powers and will report to the House of Representatives itself. In short, in short, the House of Representatives checking itself, for which I used a, learned a new German phrase, er macht den Bock zum Gärtner. Um, okay. Trump's response to this move by Congress focused on the timing, but not the substance, of canceling the Office of Congressional Ethics. He said uh, that this office was unfair, but that Congress shouldn't do this in its first re week when the spotlight is on it. In short, it looks bad. Do it when nobody's looking. By contrast, Trump's populist voters, that's on the right hand of your column in the tabella, are given little in the way of economic boost. They are promised jobs in fossil fuel and possibly defense and nuclear industries, though many of these are overseas. Two, tariffs on imports, though this is unlikely, as it will prompt retaliation by other nations, including China, damaging U.S. exports, which will irritate the column on the left, no, the column on the right, column on the left of big business. Three, um, the populist base is a promised a hawkish foreign policy, including the use of torture, which Trump believes works, and increased government surveillance of American citizens. And four, and perhaps most interestingly, his populist base is promised various forms of throw the bastards out satisfactions, including small government, though this cuts um, government programs on which many rely, B, nativist border closing, though immigrants add jobs and tax revenue to the U.S. economy, C, a, law, a tough law and order approach to criminal justice, 
historically associated with racist assumptions coloring police, jury, and judge conduct. D, Islamophobia, E, homophobia, F, protection of gun rights, and G, again, repeal of Obamacare. Moreover, after eight years of the Republicans resisting many of Obama's proposals on the grounds that they increase the deficit, the budget that is currently being considered by Congress shows an increase of the deficit to $29.1 trillion over 10 years and from the changes he will make to health insurance. This by a party that sees a balanced budget, supposedly, as so important that it calls for cutting social services in order to achieve a balanced budget. And by the right-wing Freedom Caucus, which again, supposedly sees a balanced budget as so important that a year ago, it threatened to shut down the government rather than pass an annual financial plan that didn't balance the budget. Yet from these same Republicans, we now see a contemplation of a new budget that um, uh, raises the debt to $29.1 trillion, um, which they say they will fix later. Yet Trump's public jeremiad of hellfire for Washington gives voice to economic discontent and to the belief that it will be solved by throwing the bastards out. The more unflinchingly he preaches, the more he's in sync with the national creed. To many, Trump just feels right when he promises to give a kick in the pasts to Washington insiders, something like an update on the Boston Tea Party. Other Republican candidates also had small government proposal like Trump's, but they lacked Trump's feathers and war paint yelp. In the econ if the economic situation of Trump's populist supporters worsens, the real economic sources of this worsening may go unnoticed, just as they went unnoticed under Ronald Reagan. On a small government platform, Reagan indeed began by cutting taxes twice. And he continued to so convincingly preach small governmentism that few noticed that he later raised taxes 11 times, created a more regressive tax system, and instituted the deregulation that has caused middle class purchasing power to stagnate for 40 years. Given American populist throw the bastards out fervor, you might want to know why the rich aren't thrown out. Why aren't more Americans concerned about the high number of super rich in Trump's cabinet? Betsy DeVos's net worth is over $5 billion. Wilbur Ross, $2.5 billion. Vincent Viola, $1.8 billion. The secretaries of labor and treasury are each worth in the tens of millions. Why aren't more concerned about Trump monetizing the presidency for his business interests, which unlike all other recent presidents, he will not turn over to a blind trust? or the business interests of his daughter Ivanka and her husband Jared Kushner. Why isn't there more concern with potential violations of the Stock Act, which prohibits government officials from trading on insider information, which Trump, if he continues uh, business contact and business involvement, would have such insider information? Trump's continued involvement in business while president gives foreign countries leverage over the US. Trump wants to build a series of hotels in China. Here's a list of what the Chinese want. In turn, it gives Trump businesses leverage over foreign countries who might want to pass or bend regulation in favor of his businesses while seeking US support for their political policies. Further, 
Will an attack on Trump properties overseas embroil the U.S. in a geopolitical military conflict, which would affect not only the local nation and the U.S., but its allies like Germany? Will the U.S. government, in other words, taxpayers, me, pay for security on properties bearing the Trump name, a high visibility target? Will the foreign government pay? And would foreign payment, or for that matter, foreign officials staying in the Trump hotels, violate prohibitions on presidents accepting gifts from overseas powers? These issues are not of greater concern because on the whole, the rich are not resented in America. They are considered self-responsible, inventive, and daring. In December, just this past December 2016, at a rally, Trump addressed press criticism that trade deals are being negotiated by people in his cabinet who are, quote, very rich people. To a cheering crowd, he answered, isn't that what we want? Well, what of Clinton, Obama, Sanders? They preached America's alternate gospel. Government should give the little guy a leg up, a boost, assistance. Government is not a problem to be kept as small as possible on this alternate gospel, but government is a source of help so people can get going on their own. Summing up the distinction between Clinton and Trump, the New York Times wrote that we have, quote, Mr. Trump seizing on economic dislocation in mixing populist anti-trade positions with traditionally Republican tax cutting, and Mrs. Clinton seeing a strong government hand in creating jobs and driving up wages. This alternate civil religion had its loudest chorus in the first decades of the 20th century, when widespread labor ab abuses prodded many to call for government protection from greedy elites. Teddy Roosevelt, Republican, spearheaded the reformist legislation of the progressive era. His cousin Franklin Roosevelt, Democrat, inaugurated the New Deal, both substantial increases in government programs to aid ordinary Americans. This civil religion continued through the emergencies of the Depression, World War II, and early Cold War. In 1954, the Republican President Dwight Eisenhower wrote to his brother, Edgar, should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. Sort of a list of what Trump is trying to do. There is a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Their number is negligible and they are stupid, close quote. The final hymn of our leg up civil religion was Lyndon Johnson's Civil Rights and Great Society programs, large government programs to aid the needy and to ensure minorities had their political rights. But these, seen as some as government, there it is again, government handouts, freebies to the undeserving and lazy and black, prodded a fierce anti-government backlash that remains to this day. Then came the 1960s counterculture, the hippies and the yippies, seen as more irresponsible self-indulgence. Large sectors of the nation clamored for a return to the traditional values of self-reliance, which always goes with, other side of the coin, small government-ism. The new right that emerged in the late 1960s found its first national figure in Ronald Reagan whose preaching about self-reliance and small government, as we've seen, obscured the drop in middle-class incomes. Incomes of the poor felt drastically 10.5% between 77 and 86. Income for the top 10% under Reagan rose 24.5%, and for the top 1%, 74%. Nonetheless, Reagan won a landslide victory in 1984, one of the largest landslides in American history. When it comes to solutions, people vote their beliefs. In conclusion, didn't you like the way I did that? 
Um, in conclusion, the economic tsunami of 2008 has added to the problems accumulating since 1980. America is in a civil religious war about its response. Rid ye of the devil's government remains America's oldest civil religion. It faces the newer leg up creed. 72% of Democrats see a major role for government in lifting people out of poverty. Only 36 of Republicans do. 82% of Democrats see government as having a major role in health care. Only 34% of Republicans do. Given Trump's positions and appointments, it is not clear that he will relieve the loss of work and pride suffered by his populist voters. This leaves them the choice to vote Democrat in 2018 or 2020, or to move further to the populist right. My guess is that that will depend on the programs the Democratic Party develops and with how well it educates voters at the grassroots level. At present, America, Democratic leadership is yet emerging. For instance, though much was made of the risks of Clinton's private email server, there has been but slow Democratic reaction to the risks of Russian computer hacking for the purpose of electing Trump or to the risks of Trump's business conflicts of interests. Democratic responses in Congress will emerge in the months to come. But American suspicion of government may work here as well. Again, compared to the Tea Party. The Tea Party formed quickly at the grassroots level in response to Obama. Citizen response is underway now in response to Trump, notably in donations of time and money to civil society organizations that protect civil rights, religious minorities, immigrants, the environment, etc. In the week after Trump's election, the American Civil Liberties Union, which protects civil rights, raised more money than in any week in its history. It's not the only organization that has seen an uptick. ProPublica, environmental groups, immigrant groups, sanctuary cities, etc. One area deserving immediate attention is our voting district system that gives more weight to heavily Republican rural areas than to urban Democratic ones. Because Democrats are concentrated in cities, they can win a majority of the state's population, but not a majority of the state's districts, and so end with a minority of representatives in state and federal Congress. Let me give you an example from the National Congress. Rural Republican Wyoming has two senators and one congressperson three times the congressional and electoral college representation that it would have if representation were based only on population. The electoral college, a temporary body which meets only to cast votes for the president, is based on congressional representation. If the proportion of electors to population enjoyed by my Wyoming were the same in California, California would have 159 electors instead of 55. Democrats won six out of the seven last presidential elections, but lost two in the Electoral College. In 2016, Clinton won nearly three million more votes than Trump and lost. What I hope for most concerns Americans' anti-authoritarian throw the bastard out ism, which has given us democracy, critical thinking, and a willingness to question the status quo, and also uncritical populism. Like all facets of culture, throw the bastards out ism has productive and unproductive consequences. And I would like America to know more about this part of itself. Because what we have here today with Trump is not Hobbesian, where the Leviathan sovereign is needed to stop societal chaos and is otherwise quite limited. What we have here today is also not Schmittian, 
where the fr um, fracturing of political opinion and values has so destabilized society that the sovereign faces an exceptional moment, the Ausnahmezustand, and must make a decision about society's future direction, value, and policies. What we have here today is a moment when someone is highlighting the divisions in societies and highlighting anxieties for political and monetary gain. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.